So there's a saying that I'm sure all of us have heard, and it's this, that the ends don't always justify the means. And what that statement means is that there are some processes that are so bad, such bad ideas, so hard, that they do not justify the pain that it takes to go through the process to get to the desired result. An example of that, and it's silly, but it's one that displays the point, is if you wanted to have a goal, an end result of strengthening your legs, a good process would not be jumping off the roof of your house until your legs are strong enough. That, that does not, that the end doesn't justify the means of you jumping off the house and damaging all of your joints and your ligaments. That's a, that's a bad process. But while that statement is often true, the opposite can also be true, that there are some ends that are so great that even though the process may be very painful, the ends still justify it. There are things in life that display that. And in this series, we've been talking about that idea of the end. And we're going to be talking about the second phrase of this, that there is an end that will justify the means, that will justify, honestly, the pain, that will justify the suffering and the hardship that we experience in life. But see, the problem is, is we don't always know what those means are, what that process will be, because as we talked about in the first week of this series, life is full of uncertainty. Uncertainty is a fact regardless of who you are, where you come from, how educated you are, how much money you have. All of us cannot define, none of us can define the process and how our tomorrow will look. But even though life is full of uncertainty, there are certain things. We can be certain that there is still goodness. We can be certain that actually God is with us. We can be certain that God is good and his ways are good and his decisions are good. And that's what we've been talking about thus far in this series. And we can also trust that there are some ends that even though the process to get to that end may seem like the worst thing in the world, we can be certain that the end is good. Matter of fact, I didn't come up with this thought. Jesus actually did. And one day when he was talking with his disciples, he shares this analogy. And it comes out of John 16, starting in verse 20. And Jesus says, Truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will will rejoice. That's a process. That's an in the meantime. That's a means. That's not the end, as Jesus is saying. He says, you will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. So Jesus honestly paints a kind of a bleak picture. He looks at his disciples and the guys that have been following him around for several years now, and he says, listen, guys, I know you think that you have an idea of what this is going to look like in the end. And I know that you all have your own individual ends that you would like to see come about, whether that's me being king, overthrowing Rome, healing everybody, fixing every problem as it is in this very moment. But I need to let you know that times are still coming. A process will still come in which you will be full of sorrow. That not only will you be full of sorrow, but those around you who don't agree with you will be glad of your sorrow. Well, Jesus, this is kind of a, a hard picture to believe. Jesus says, but though, don't lose sight in the meantime because there will be an end, and I have an end in mind. And that is at the end of that verse, your sorrows will be turned to joy. And then he shares this beautiful story. 21 it says, when a woman go, is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into the world. 22. So you also will have suffering, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy from you. Now, as much as a man can understand Walking through my wife's last two pregnancies with our boys, there is so much pain to bring apart, to bring out that purpose of a child. The morning sickness, 
the, the cravings, but also being disgusted by foods you used to love. You know, the stretching, the, the back pain, the not sleeping good, all of the pain. And that's not even the birthing part. That's just the carrying part. That's just nine months of not feeling normal. And then it's not over. Because as anybody knows that's either been pregnant or walked along somebody that has been pregnant, it's a slow climb, right? But it doesn't just slowly climb and then drop off. No, it slowly climbs and then it shoots to the sky because why? Then you have to go into what is potentially hours upon hours upon hours of arduous, painful, most painful thing in your life, labor. That sounds terrible. Like, as a man... Don't take this the wrong way, but I'm thankful that I don't have to birth babies. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. I'm, just, I'm glad because there might be a lot less people in the world if men had to go about that. You women are so strong. It is incredible. But why do you do that? Not just once for a lot of you, but twice, three times. Sometimes some of you are so crazy, you'll do it four, five, or six times. What are you thinking? Well, because the end will justify the means. What is the end? It's life. It's your children that you would do anything for, including give up your life. And so there are some processes that regardless of how terrible they are, regardless of how threatening they may be, it's still worth the end. Why? Because at the end of it is often life. The greatest results honestly usually come from the hardest processes and pain. And Jesus knew this. And even if we think about Jesus as he's telling this story, that's such a beautiful story and that the creator of the world, I think that's so awesome, that the one who knits us together in our womb, the one who has been from the beginning, the alpha, the omega, he sits down and he tells this beautiful picture of which he designed. He knows. He's not, he's not absent in our pain. He walks with us in our pain. He understands what it takes to bring a child into the world. And he tells this beautiful story and the disciples have no clue. They have no clue that Jesus himself is about to go through his own birthing pains, if you will. Because when he shares this story, it is literally the night of his betrayal. Judas, an, an ex-follower, if you will, comes in and betrays Jesus with a kiss and hands him over to the authorities. And so, of course, Jesus is whisked away and he's taken and he's falsely accused, he's lied upon, he's spat on, he's kicked, he's hit, he has a crown of thorns shoved on his head, he's nailed to a cross, and all the while, these disciples who are like, nah, Jesus, nah, we'll be with you forever and ever to the end, amen, right? That very night, Peter, because he began to lose sight of the end in mind, what happens with Peter while all this is happening with Jesus, and he's in the most incredible pain of his, his life here on earth, Peter, his most trusted follower, steps aside, and because of the prodding of a teenage girl who questions him, he denies his Lord not once, not twice, but three times. Well, why? Well, it's easy to point fingers, but Peter lost sight of the end. He began to think that the process was king and not that Jesus was king. And you know who's to blame him? Because sometimes in our pain, it is very easy to lose sight of the end. It is easy to lose sight of God's promises. It's easy to lose sight that one day there will be joy again, even though we feel like we're drowning in sorrow. See, Jesus wanted his disciples to know these two things. He wanted them to know that one, pain is real. Pain is real. I think it's easy sometimes as Christian believers to think that if we just had enough faith that there would be no more pain, and that is just not the case. One, again, because Jesus himself went through extraordinary pain for you and for I because who was on the other side of that, of that birth pain for Jesus? Why did he go through that? Well, it's for the second reason, and he told his disciples that two, there will be an end to pain. So see, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, went through his own birthing pains of sorts, went through his own terrible process. Why? Because we were his end. He needs us to know that not only is there pain, but he is with us in the pain and there will be an end to pain. 
And so with that in mind, let us never lose sight of the end in our mind. So matter of fact, the reason that Jesus can say this and that we can believe this is because what he says next in this story. So he shares the story of the mother and disciples are like, okay, Jesus, this is a little confusing. Well, we wish you would speak a little more plainly. And so Jesus speaks as plainly as he can. And so he says this in chat, in verse 33. He says, listen, he says, I have told you these things. Like, listen, guys, come close, come close. So that you may have peace. Because what's coming is about to disrupt the boat. <laughs> it's about to throw you the biggest curveball you've ever seen. But listen, you will have suffering. You didn't follow me so that it would be easy. You followed me for what I'm about to say next. Be courageous because I have conquered the world. Be courageous because I have conquered the world. So each week in the series, we've been looking at promises. And the first week was that God has promised to always be with us. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Jesus was forsaken in, this, in these very next moments for our sake. You don't have to be afraid because Jesus will never leave you or forsake you. And then last week we talked about that God promises us that he is always good. And he's always working for our good. And we can trust him with our good. And we do not have to despair or fall into a place of depression and stay there because God is good. And lastly, the promise that we can cling to. The end in mind for us as, as Christian followers, as Jesus followers, is this last and final promise. And it's this. God is always victorious. Or another way to say it, in the end, we win. In the end, we win. Not because I can win, not because you can win, not even because collectively we can win. In Jesus, we win because Jesus has the victory. He has overcome the world. He has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so the end in mind for us as believers isn't those nice things that we want to have because that's often what we do. We make a shallow end in our life. We put an end on something that we can attain by ourselves. Money, status, influence, uh, a good name for ourselves, comfort comfort, happiness, dating relationships, whatever those may be, those are not real ends. The real end is that in the end, we win because God is always victorious. And so the Christian answer to a lot of what's happening in the world, both now and in the past and in the future, is when we see hurt and we see pain and we see hatred and we see anger, we shouldn't jump up and say, let me tell you how to get to where you want to be. Listen, pain is real. There is evil in the world. We do have an adversary, but he's not the end either. In the end, we win because God is always victorious. God is always victorious. Looking back at Peter's example, see, Peter thought that Jesus was losing. Let's be honest. Peter thought that Jesus had lost. And so if we don't set our heart like a, a chain tied to a concrete block of faith that's saying, listen, no matter what comes, no matter how I feel, or no matter my circumstances, I know that God is always victorious. We will be like Peter. That not major things, that's what's so ironic and funny and sad is that Peter, the one with the most personality, the one that seemed to have the most, most vibrato, the one who had just recently that same night pulled out a sword ready to attack an army of Roman soldiers. That same Peter so quickly lost the end. He, he didn't have the end in mind anymore that Jesus was going to conquer the world. He forgot what Jesus had just said. And when a teenage girl asked him, do you know him? He was like, no, 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 I don't. Why? Because he lost sight of the end. But see, we as Christians, this needs to be our statement of belief. As Jesus followers, we believe that what Jesus did on the cross is the start, and this is going to be key in a minute, the start of a revolution that will one day be finished. That we believe that what Jesus did on the cross is the start of a revolution that will one day be finished. 
So why do I say the start of? Because here's a tension that maybe isn't talked about enough. Is that Jesus will say statements and has said statements in scripture that hold truth even though they haven't quite been completely fulfilled yet. See, the problem with talking about the end is we're very linear. There is an end to a story. There is an end to a person's life. There's an end to a career. There's always an end. Well, here's the problem. We know from Scripture that God is both the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. And so what winds up happening, the reason we lose sight of the end is because we're thinking that God is also working on the same timetable as us. And so in the middle of our pain, God has somehow failed, we guess. We suppose God has somehow forgotten about us. God possibly maybe isn't good like he promised, or maybe he has even abandoned us. None of that is true. It's just that God is operating on a different schedule than the rest of us. I don't know how many of you guys have one, but we have a family calendar that me and my wife share because it's so easy to get off sync. And what happens when you get off sync? You get frustrated. You wonder whose fault it was. Why, why didn't you tell me we had this kid birthday party? I had much better plans. I don't want to go hang out with a bunch of three-year-olds. Why didn't you tell me that? Maybe that's a personal thing. Maybe you love three-year-old birthday parties, but they're not that fun, to be honest with you. But a scheduling conflict leads to more conflict. But when your calendar is in sync, you can understand that while I may have to do some things I don't want to do, it eventually will get me to where I want to go. And the same is when we follow God. Don't let your calendar, your schedule, supersede that of the creator of the universe. Don't suppose that your agendas are so important that God's looking and changing his agendas based on yours. And that's not a statement to say that you're not important. You are infinitely important. So important that God did split history for your soul to rescue you by sending his son. But sometimes we need a calendar adjustment. We need to seek and look and become synced with God's calendar and not our own. See, Jesus went through his painful process. Jesus went through his birthing. And he was able to keep the end in mind because let's think about this. And this is so powerful. Is that there's the story of Jesus in the garden before this conversation, before his arrest, before his crucifixion, where Jesus has a, a moment of crisis actually. And he even asked the father, Father, if there is any way, if there is any way, let that way be the way. If there is any other process, let that be the process. But Father, because I trust you, because I know that you're with me, because I know that you are good, and because I know that in the end, your end is the end I need to seek, let it be your will and not mine. Well, how could Jesus think this way? Well, it's because Jesus, his entire ministry, said things just like this. John chapter 3, verse 14. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And here it is. For God loved the world in this way, or as many of you have heard it, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone, anyone, all that who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it through him. Literally, at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus states what he knows to be the end. That he would have to go through immense pain and suffering. And why? Because the Father's end in mind was you. God the Father's end in mind was us. And so Jesus knew that there were some ends that justified the means. Matter of fact, the ends that God had in mind 
were so severe, so eternity important, that it cost his one and only son to leave his side, his splendor, and his power to come down and be here with us. To live and to die and to raise again. See, the Christian hope is that one day God will finish this work. See, the tension in the, not, in the, in the has been and not yet is the reality is the greatest event in human history has already happened. God is always victorious. He has always been victorious. He will always be victorious. In the end, we win. But just as he tried to encourage his disciples, listen, there will still be pain and sorrow. And there will be moments in your life where people will be actively rooting against you. And you know what? That doesn't mean that God has forgotten you. That actually probably means you are in his purpose. You are doing what you're supposed to be doing. There will be people that wish for your downfall when you're seeking after God. And that isn't a mark on God's faithfulness. That shows that there is still an enemy. There is still an active agent out for destruction. But let me tell you, don't lose sight of the end. Because in the end, God is always victorious. We win and the devil will be put into his place. He will be under our feet. Every tear will be wiped away. Every broken thing will be made right. Why? Because in the end, we win because God wins. That's the end in mind. How do you keep the end in mind when there seems to be no end in sight? Know that God has never or will never fail. Circumstances do not dictate what God does. But how we trust him in the circumstances dictates how he operates within us in them. So don't lose heart. There is an end. And the reason I want to share this with you is because this is, this is so, so, so important. And, and, and I want to share this quick picture, and I'm going to get to, to, to a couple quick things here that are going to be practical because a lot of this has been, uh, I guess, theology and understanding. But I do want to read this here. This is what Revelation, who ironically is written by John, who also just read, uh, wrote the book of John, who we've been reading. So John, at the end of his life, he has a vision. And this is the end vision in which he describes that we can lock hold to with everything we have. You know like how a kitten grabs hold of your forearm and you're like, how are you doing that? It hurts so much. Lock onto this truth like that cat and say, I'm not letting go dig your claws. And this is what John says in Revelation 21. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. The sea, by the way, stands for chaos, destruction, because what is the sea? It's chaos. It's uncontainable. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven uh, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne say, look, God's dwelling is with humanity. In the end, God will not be distant. He will be with us. And all, and he, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear. Type every tear tear. Because you know what a tear symbolizes? All those hard things, all those broken places in your life, all those things that you've done or have been done against you, all of those things, God will make it right. He's not just going to erase it. He's going to fix it. He will wipe, wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Don't lose sight when there seems to be no end in sight. Instead, keep the end that God has promised us in mind all the time. God is always victorious. In the end, we win. Those who put our faith in Jesus, we, we win. It will be okay. And I know sometimes that feels shallow, but it's the truth. Sometimes the truth doesn't always wrap you up like a warm sweater on a cold day. Sometimes the truth is just that. It's the last line of hope that we can cling to in the hardest of times, but it doesn't make it any less true. In the, win, in the end, we win. So, we're living in this already but not yet reality. 
God has promised us things and he has already set into motion his great plan of redeeming humanity, of making it all new and making it all right. But what are we to do in the meantime? Better yet, what does victorious living look like? Because I don't want this kind of mindset when we say, well, in the end we win, mean that we just have to sit back and suffer. No, it should spur us to a certain kind of action. If you know that God can't fail and then when you're walking in his plan and purposes, you can't either. You will fail if you walk outside of them, but you can't when you're walking in them. What does victorious living look like? So a few quick things. First, victorious living looks like joyful living. Believing that the best is yet to come even in the worst. Celebrating even in the hard times. You know what joyful living doesn't look like? It doesn't look like negativity. Have you ever been inspired by hanging out with a negative person? No, two things happen. Either A, you're repelled by them, or two, you become like them. Negative people are some people that you need to run away from, but the concern that I have for a lot of us, because we can all fall into this, when we lose sight of the end and we no longer have it in mind, we become negative people. And I think God's church has not been characterized in the last 50 years in our nation or any other nation as a bunch of joyful people. We're a bunch of complaining, negative, backstabbing people more than likely. That is not having the end in mind. Listen, even if you're persecuted, it doesn't matter. God's still good and he loves you and he's with you and he'll never leave you. We react to what God has done, not what happens to us. That's the reality. I know that's hard to do, but that's just the reality. We are joyful, rain, flood, sunshine, whatever. Victorious living is joyful living. Joyful living means celebrating others even if they get what you want because you realize that that probably isn't the end that God had for you. The end in mind is keeping the end in sight in what Jesus has promised us. He has conquered the world. Because you could attain that end and it'll leave you just as empty, just as negative, just as bitter. Matter of fact, bitterness often comes for getting, with, getting what we want and realizing it doesn't fix us like we hoped it would. That's why there's so many negative people in the world. That's why so many of us in the last years of our life are so bitter. Because we're not living victorious living. We've lost the end in sight. Second thing, second, second wave, uh, second thing that victorious living looks like is forgiving living. If you know that God has rescued us all and will rescue us all, that he will fix it all. We have no responsibility or right to hold on to hurts of how people hurt us. We have all been a part of that process. We have all done hurtful things. We have all done things to get our own lives ahead of others at the cost of them. But the reality is a victorious person can say, you know what, listen, maybe you've wronged me and you've wronged me greatly, but I am not bound to that because I have a better end in mind in which my Savior will right every wrong. He is just, he is good, and he's merciful. And one day when he wipes that tear, I won't be thinking about what you did to me, so I'm certainly not going to let it drag me down for the rest of my life here. There's too much to do. There's too much to see. There's too much joy to have. And not forgiving people robs you of joy. Joyful living, forgiving living. Three, generous living. Victorious living looks like generous living. Do you know what generosity actually is? Let me make a clarifying statement here. Generosity isn't occasionally giving people something when they ask for it. That's certainly a portion of generosity. Generosity thinking is always assuming that there's more than enough to go around. There's always more than enough. My sons love jelly beans. And we like to go to a place in Maggie Valley. It's Jelly Bellies. I'm sure you heard of it. And it's so many jelly beans. But it's funny even though they have always had more than enough jelly beans, like, like, hear me now, they have never finished all of their jelly beans. 
But they can still be so stingy because they don't want to, they don't want to share because they're assuming that when they give some to somebody else, a friend, a cousin, or each other, that it's going to take away from them. That's not generous thinking. Generous thinking is always thinking that, listen, if you need more jelly beans, boy, daddy will buy you more jelly beans. I've always bought you more jelly beans. Don't assume that you're going to run out and never have them again. But that is how we think. Is our God not the God of a cattle on a thousand hill? Is he not the God of always enough, more than enough, and of plenty? He fed the people of Israel in the desert for 40 years from bread from heaven, for goodness sake. And then he sent birds from who knows where. But we like to think that God is going to hold out on us and there's not going to be enough, so I'm going to hoard it in. Listen, whether it's financially, whether it's gifts, generous living says Thank you, pass it through. Thank you, pass it on. Because I know that there's always more than enough for where that came from. That's what generous thinking is. That's what victorious living is. Because in the end, you can't take it with you. I, it's, it's easy to say this, but hard to live out. But I would rather die poor in money and wealthy in relationships and acts of service and love. Because when I step before my Savior, he will not ask me, my Dustin, did you zero out your bank account before you came to make sure that everything was still there? He will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You loved those that I came and died for. That's generous living. That's victorious living. And the last thing, and then we're finished. Victorious living looks like content living. Being okay where you are, knowing that God isn't planning to leave you there. That's really what contentment is. Being content where you are, realizing that God doesn't plan to leave you there. Are you where you want to be right now? I can guarantee you with 99.999% accuracy that all of us would probably say no. And so we have two options. We can either rage against that, we can be angry and bitter at God for that, or we can say, God, I trust that I am right where you need to be. I have what you need me to have. You have gifted me with what you need me to be gifted with, but I trust that you won't leave me here and that you will continue to move me forward. Let's pretend for a moment. Let's pretend that everybody who believes in Jesus thought like that for just a moment, can you picture how different the world would be? Can you get a taste of it? If everybody was content, not complacent, but content, fully trusting that when we were ready, God will move us forward. It will change the world if we did that. So how do you keep the end in mind when there's no end in sight? John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering, but be courageous, for I have conquered the world. God is always victorious. In the end, we win. So right before I close, and please don't click off, hang with me for about another 45 seconds. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, I want to tell you uh, pretty bluntly that you don't get to take part in this victory. But the pathway to step into relationship with Jesus is as simple as taking a quiet moment right now, wherever you are. Driving, sitting on your couch, listening to a podcast, watching this on YouTube, whatever you're doing, and declaring to Jesus that you want him to rescue you. And so I'm going to say a quick prayer. I would like you to repeat it out loud wherever you are under your breath, but it's what you declare really in your heart and not just with your lips that makes the difference. So let's close our eyes for a second. I'm going to just say a quick prayer. Jesus, I don't fully understand everything that I just heard, but I trust that your promises are true. And so I ask that you rescue me, that you save me, that you forgive me, and that you allow me to take part in your victory as a child of God. Forgive me of how, how I have fallen short and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you just prayed that prayer, or if you would like to have any further discussions or you would like to connect with somebody, I would love for you to do that. You can text the number that's on the screen right now, 803-373-5255. That goes directly to the church. Somebody will go back to you within minutes, and so we want to be able to connect with you. Also, if you're new today, you can do that as well. But we love you, church. We can't wait to see you. Eventually, we are praying for you. Stay safe out there, but ultimately, live victorious. See ya.